market volatility. Sure to be most extraordinary program as uh, we've already had a small preview. Without further delay, join me with a, a warm welcome to Ms. Vaughn. Thank you. Good evening. I am pleased to be here. Um, it looks like the uh, bulb went out in my overhead. Um, no, I don't think so, but you never know. I think that was what we call an out. Um, <laughs> You know that they don't have these problems at the White House. <laughs> um, anyway, let me just compliment the uh, Granada Forum. This is an all-volunteer organization. The bottom line is they sacrifice. And that is a little bit about what I have done these last four years. My husband has been very gracious as we've used a lot of our money to allow me to go to many of these conferences. I now have uh, the Women's International Media Group that helps. And since we're sort of offline, I think, let me just talk about some of the things that are uh, back there. Um, I have two tapes. This one in the red jacket is from the World Economic Forum. And it is a wonderful video of Kofi Annan and Maurice Strong and Renee, uh, uh, Renato Ruggiero from the World Trade Organization, all the major players. And they did this to talk about the empowerment of what they see happening on the UN level. Yours truly, of course, gets a question in. Uh, this, uh, this tape is a speech that I did up in uh, California, excuse me, up in California, right, up in San Francisco, and it's called The New World Order, The Brits and You. And I specifically talk about Agenda 21 and what's going on in Santa Cruz along with the rest of the uh, United Nations agenda. Um, the speech that we're going to have this evening will talk about the international economic order. And my newsletter series from last year talks about it, has a number of the overheads that you're going to see this evening. Uh, enough of that. I understand that since I'm your 283rd speaker, that uh, you are very well informed. And as such, we're not going to be talking about the, the normal things that people hear about. Uh, when I was reading your paper today, there was uh, something called Perspective by Coffee Annan in today's newspaper, LA Times, talks about the UN must be part of the solution. We're going to be talking about what he meant. Uh, then we have Alan Greenspan, who says it's a time to cut rates. Well. Uh, it is or it isn't, depending on your view of what's going on in the marketplace. My premise this evening is very simply this, that the Asian crisis was planned. It's part of the agenda to seize control, the final control, of the banking system of the world and put it in the hands of the globalists through the Bank for International Settlements and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, what will this do? The bottom line is it will reduce, eliminate the economic sovereignty of the countries of the world. Now, when I determined that the Asian crisis was planned was when I wrote my December 1997 newsletter, and it was a very in-depth newsletter. And as I put it together, I said, wait a minute, this thing isn't a crisis, you know, a real crisis? But I started seeing that there was more evidence to show that the whole crisis was planned. Now, where are we? I believe that we are in the fourth phase or the final phase of the empowerment uh, on an economic level. What was the first phase? The first phase was in the 1940s, the creation of the Bretton Woods monetary system. Many of you are familiar with that, the IMF, the World Bank. The World Trade Organization was an idea at the time that our Congress would not uh, pass However, thank you, Bill Clinton, the, globalist the most globalist president we've had since Roosevelt uh, in 1994. As you know, uh, NAFTA, NAFTA and GATT were passed, the General Agreement of Trade and Tariffs. So we basically, the, the economic system of the world was set in 1944. Interestingly enough, 
That was 1944. In 1945 is when the UN was birthed. And what did they do first? They got the money, the monetary system. Then they went for the governmental uh, organization because with the UN came something called international law. Now, international law is about 350 years old, or modern international law is about 350 years old. And uh, we've always had international law. That's how one country interacts with another country. However, with the creation of the United Nations in 1945, there has been more international law created in the last 53 years than all of history beforehand with how countries interact. Why? International law is basically something that they are creating on the global level as they go along. It was very interesting that when you start taking a look at international law, that the bottom line is very simply this. Every time they have a conference, every time they write a book, every time they float an idea out there, you know, they get all the buddies to say, yeah, 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 that's a great idea. And they start writing it into international law. Every time the General Assembly meets, every time they pass a resolution, it goes into this new body called international law. In the 1970s, you know that Nixon took us off of the gold standard. And that began the second phase of where we're at. The whole world did something that had never been done before. Since the beginning of time, there was a medium of exchange. And it was gold. You can go back to Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus. And it was gold. And so the monetary system of God is the hard assets, the gold, the silver, a couple cows, okay, clothing. That's the monetary system of God. But in, the 19, in 1971, Nixon took us off of the gold standard, and the first time in all of history, our monetary system on a global basis floated. It was whatever they wanted it to be, basically. In 1973, you may or may not recall that the uh, world currency markets closed down for twice, once in February, Valentine's weekend, and in 1973, and then in March for two weeks. Paul Volcker was president uh, or chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. And for two weeks, the uh, central bank ministers met to determine what was going to happen, what was going to be the value of the economic system of the world. The third phase started in, in 1980. In 1980, our government passed the uh, Monetary Deregulation Act of 1980. And when they passed that law, now, many people remember that law because guess what? Interest rates were allowed to float. And for the first time in history, uh, money market funds, a new phenomena, was paying 15, 18%. And so when they told the American people about how wonderful this law was, that's all we heard. But we didn't hear the rest of the story that we're going to discuss this evening. The, uh, that banking law was responsible for $1.3 trillion moving around the world in fast money. And that is what they are now saying today is the problem. They are saying, we've got to fix the international system. And this is the final thrust. We are going into phase four, the final thrust, control of the rest of the world monetary system. And so what is Bill Clinton calling for? He's calling for a new Bretton Woods. They are calling for international taxation and international credit corp. They're talking about an international bankruptcy court. Uh, of course, all of this to be through the International Monetary Fund. And so that's where we are at right now, and that's what we're going to be discussing. Now, in order to discuss this, we must be in a position in which we understand the background and then the major players. So the background will consist of the United Nations and the role of the British royal family, number one, free trade zones, two, something called globalization, which was the third phase of this whole process that I mentioned a moment ago, the Glass-Steagall Act, and public-private partnerships. See, but see I, I'm very confident that you can handle all this, and you could handle it much better if we had an overhead, but I know that you can handle it because you are smart. Now, if we were to take a look at the world map, 
a normal world map, what would we see? We'd see 188 countries in which there'd be lines drawn between those countries. Now, as we look at that world map, I don't know, when I look at the world map, you know what I see? I see America. I see America. And that's what makes my heart stop. When you look at all the countries of the world, we have a constitution. We have the only constitution in the world in which we get our freedoms from God, the God who created heaven and earth. Our freedoms are unlimited, unnumbered. They cannot take them away from me because I'm here at the Granada Forum and I'm going to talk against the United Nations. They are mine. They come from God. That's what sets us apart. Now, in order to have world government, what do you have to do? Well, you have to erase those lines. You have to erase them politically. You have to erase them economically. And that's what they have done. Now, who are the brains behind the erasure? Well, you had Dr. Stan Monteith here recently, I guess within the last six months. And I have to tell you of my respect for Stan Monteith. What an awesome man. He has been like a mentor to me. And I remember when I first got on Stan's program, I said to him, you know, Dr. Stan, I've gone to these conferences and I watch them, and I watch them dance around the podium, and I said, they look like marionette dolls. I said, it, it's, it's, what's happening is not coming from them. It's somebody else's agenda. And if you've heard Stan, he's got that deep voice, and he laughed, just chuckled over the phone. He said, oh, Joan, have you read Carol Quigley's The Anglo-American Establishment? I said, no. And he chuckled again. He said, you must read that book. He said, because Carol Quigley, and you will recall that Carol Quigley was Bill Clinton's mentor at Georgetown University. He said, Carol Quigley wrote that book. It was published after he died. And he basically showed how John C Cecil John Rhodes, how it was his fortune that he left to establish a way to reunite the United States with Great Britain. Well, I got a hold of that book through Dr. Stan, and I started reading about Cecil Rhodes, the, the diamond magnate, the aristocrat who, not in uh, Rhodes' book, excuse me, Carol Quigley's book will you read, but you will read about him in his biography by uh, Rothberg, called the founder, that he was a Mason, 33rd degree Mason, and he was a blatant homosexual. And so this man, who basically, who basically thumbed his face in everything that you and I believe in, is the man who left his fortune from gold and diamonds in order to find a way to bring America back under British control. And so, as I read the book, I started looking for a way. I started looking for how this could happen. Well, interestingly enough, uh, I attended the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. And, oh, let me just mention that the founders, the, the trustees of the Rhodes Trust, came up with the idea of the League of Nations. That did not fly. However, the United Nations, the successor to the League, did fly. And that then that then began, became now those on the front row, God bless you, you, can, you might be able to read it, but I didn't make them big enough for <laughs> those of you in the back. And um, the problem is that I now need them to speak. <laughs> They're not going to be up there. So the, the point is that Cecil Rhodes found a way to bring America back under British rule, and that is through the United Nations. I was on the Michael Reagan show, and I said to Michael, you know, Michael, I, I read all of this, and I do all of this research, and it was one sunny afternoon last year during the summer that I was cleaning house, and it hit me. If, if, 
not that. <coughs> if the British royal family is behind the United Nations, then that means when the United Nations was formed, that we entered world government officially. Now, if that is true, then it also means that when we reverted back under British rule, excuse me, that when our Senate when our Senate approved the United Nations Charter, that we reverted back under British rule. Now, let me tell you, if that didn't hit me, because I thought, wait a minute, we have been then under British rule since 1945. So I started looking for a connection between the British royal family and the United Nations. And when I was at the United Nations 50th anniversary in San Francisco um, in June of 1995 is when I then saw Princess Margaret there. And so Princess Margaret was there, and I thought, no reason. Okay, fine. However, it was not until I attended the uh, October edition of the IMF World Bank meeting, October 1996, that I saw a book called, published by the Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum, in partnership with the World Bank and the United Nations. And I said, oh my God, there's my link. There is my direct link. I spent a year researching this book for my book, Prince Charles, The Sustainable Prince. Now, who is the prince? Prince Charles, basically, he has lineage. The British royal family, they've been uh, top dog, if you will. I hope they don't mind. They've been top dog since 850 AD. Charles has lineage, he has position, he has power automatically as being a member of the British royal family. He was crowned as prince. He is a Renaissance man. Did you know he's a man of war? He flies the Harrier T-4, the Phantom Jet, the Jet Provost. Can you imagine? He looks like a wimp, doesn't he? That's all a front. It's all a front. The man is absolutely brilliant. He is a philosopher king. I, Gaia, you know, the worship of Earth, that comes from Charles. Not originally, but it comes as a result of his adaptation and his belief that the Earth has precedence over man. He is a hidden prince. He's the man behind the scenes. He basically himself says he works behind the scenes. He is the leader of the Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum, and that's the brochure that I picked up at the World Bank. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum. And there's another thing that he does, and that is that he sets up something called public-private partnerships all over the world. How many of you know or understand what a public-private partnership is? All right, you're going to learn this evening because when I explain it to you, you're going to say, oh my God. And you're going to understand that what Charles is really doing is setting up a new form of government all over the world. Is he doing it here in the United States? I don't know directly if he's doing it directly in the U.S., but our own government is setting up public-private partnerships. Now, Charles is our first um, background piece of information. The second one is called globalization. And as I started studying what was going on on the global economic level, I, I came up with my own definition of globalization. Let me read it to you. Through constant change, the blending together of economies, people, laws, politics, money, and social ethics into one. The convergence or harmonization, i.e. homogenation, of the world from individual nation states into one world, a world without borders. What does globalization do? Well, first of all, it erases the borders economically. How does it do that? I mentioned the 1980 Bank Deregulation Act. Well, what else did that do besides give us money market fund rates? It, it tore down all of the rules and the regulations that our country had with other countries around the world in which we could now invest in foreign countries. Okay? At the same time, I didn't know this until I read a document from the Bank for International Settlements, all the other group of seven countries were passing the same kind of law. So they were all tearing down the borders so that when you now look at a map, thank you, of the world, 
There are no borders economically. And that is why we now have hot money, $1.3 trillion, floating around the world on a daily basis looking for the highest play. All right? Globalization. They created it. Now, you know, it's interesting, as I have been studying how they're going to fix the system, because Bill Clinton, you may recall that he spoke before the Council for Foreign Relations about a week and a half ago, and he called for a meeting of the group of seven economic ministers and central bank ministers to come to Washington, D.C. Uh, next week, and I've been talking to the Treasury, and they don't know when yet, but to come next week, right before the IMF World Bank meeting, and discuss new ways to fix the system. That's what we're going to be discussing tonight, is what they're going to discuss. And they don't have to fix the system. They don't have to give power to the IMF World Bank. All they have to do is put the laws back up here that, that give us our economic sovereignty. That's all they have to do. Give us our economic sovereignty back, and we don't have to worry about hot money, and we don't have to empower the IMF or the World Bank. It's as simple as that. Now, when we start taking a look at how all of this hot money flows around the world, how does it do that? Well, I'll give you some examples through private mutual funds, pension plans, state pensions, uh, trust funds. This is basically how all this money flows around the world. It's real simple. Okay, and so here we are, and I've been in investment. And I remember 10 years ago, they started telling me, it's okay, they started telling me as an investment advisor, Send your client monies overseas. Look at Austria. Look at all these other countries. Look at the rates they've gotten. And America's only got a 3.5 growth rate. Who do you think that was orchestrated by? The International Monetary Fund. Where has this money been going? This money has been going, and I'm, I'm sorry this is a little dark, but this shows about $80 billion, $90 billion between 1990, 1990 and 1990. Excuse me, 1989 and 1983, 1993. Excuse me, going out of the world, um, out of out of the U.S., invested elsewhere. Where is the first number one country all of the investment money has been going to? Ask Mark Templeton. It's been going to China, number one, Mexico, number two, Argentina, number three, Thailand, four, Korea, five, Malaysia, seven, and Indonesia, eleven. Do any of these countries sound like they've been in the news recently? Interesting, isn't it? So what does globalization really do? This is a quote from a Foreign Affairs Journal, um, September, October 1997. Globalization thus leads to internationalization or the transfer of regulatory authority from the national level to international institutions. That's what globalization does. What is globalization doing? You see, if you're going to change money and where money can flow, you have to change the laws. It's a double whammy. You get the money and you get the laws. Okay? And that's what globalization has been doing. It is a, it is a complete transfer to the international level. So what do we now have? We have a world without borders. We are there economically and politically. Uh, and now we're seeing legally through the International Criminal Court the very same thing. And I'm sorry we can't talk about the International Criminal Court, but I do have a report. So what is our battle today? What is our true battle? Our true battle is nationalism versus globalism. All right. Nationalism is being an American. Kosovo, what are they talking about in the news with Kosovo? Who's the enemy? The nationalists. Have you noticed that? The nationalists. That is the question. That is the question you want to ask your congressmen and women, your senators, the people that you're electing. It's one simple question. Are you for the US Constitution? Are you a nationalist? Or are you a globalist? What did President Clinton say in the State of the Union address this past year? I'm going to read you two phrases. He said, quote, we must exercise responsibility, not just at home, 
but around the world. America must stand against the poisoned appeals of extreme nationalism. To meet these challenges, we are helping to write international rules of the road for the 21st century. Protecting, protecting those who join the family of nations and isolating those who do not. All right? Now, the Washington Times printed that speech. Well, let me tell you where I was when I heard that. I had just gotten to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. I switched on the TV. Bill Clinton is speaking. That's what I heard. I called my girlfriend in America and I said, did you hear that speech? She never caught it. She found it in the middle, just, just hidden in the middle of that whole speech. What else is happening? We have globalization. But there's something else that's happening, very, very important. We are being divided up. We are being divided up into five major trading spheres. We have Europe, which is called the Economic and Monetary Union of Europe. In about three months, we're going to, they are going to have a new currency called the Euro. We have the Middle East, that's up and coming. Africa, you don't forget Clinton went to Africa earlier this year. That's an, another up and coming free, tra free trade zone. We have Asia, and we have the Americas. I have back there a report from when I went to the Summit of the Americas. How many of you know that Bill Clinton, I saw with my own eyes, I saw Bill Clinton, the other 33 presidents and prime ministers of the countries of our hemisphere, sign a document called the Free Trade Areas of the America. And the Free Trade Areas of the America basically erases all of the, law, the, the zones, the laws between us to make us one. We are no longer the United States of America. We are the Americas, Canada, Mexico, Central and South America. There is a report. Now, wait, I have a report back there on the, uh, the Constitution for the 21st century. It talks all about what Clinton did in March, all right? And there are documents you can get from the State Department. When you read them, you will turn purple. It's absolutely horrible. Now, one of the things I haven't talked about is public-private partnerships. All of these are public-private partnerships. And when I explain that in a minute, you'll understand what I'm saying. So, we're being divided up into economic trade zones. Now, how are we divided up when we start taking a look at the world? There are three major zones, you know that. We have America, or the Americas now, we are governed by the dollar. We have Europe that will be governed by the Deutschmark. And we have Asia, which will be governed by the yen. And every time you hear what the value of the dollar is, it's always against the Deutschmark and the yen. Okay, now, when I was taking a look and when I was writing my economic newsletter on Asia, I said to myself, what really happened here? This is what happened in Asia. The World Trade Organization has a document called the Financial Services Agreement, the World Trade Organization Financial Services Agreement. And that thing, it was a couple years in being written, and it finally got adopted in December of 1997. Now, what did that call for? The Free Trade, uh, the Financial uh, Services Agreement called for all the countries of the world to allow other banks and brokerage houses and insurance companies to buy into their banks and brokerage companies and insurance companies. Who didn't want to go along with that? Thailand, Malaysia, Korea, and to some extent, Japan. They said, no thank you, we want to keep our economic sovereignty. Okay? Let me tell you what, what Renato Ruggiero said about the financial services agreement. He said, it commits more than 70 countries to open up their banking, insurance, and financial sectors to competition beginning March 1999. Nations representing over 95% 
of the trade in banking, insurance, securities, and financial information have brought it under the realm of international law. That's what he said. What's at stake? $18 trillion in global securities, $38 trillion in global domestic bank lending, $2.2 trillion in worldwide insurance premiums. They didn't want to sign the financial services agreement. That's $58 trillion, all right? Now, what happens to a country, excuse me, what happens to a country that does not want to join? You've already seen what happened to Asia, haven't you? Interestingly enough, when we take a look at Asia right now, their market's down 40%. So what has happened is Asia has been taken out of the pool of areas to invest. Where has the money been redirected? Europe. Why should it be redirected to Europe? The euro. It has to be. You see, the euro cannot fly without a redirection of money from Asia, which was up and coming and powerful, to make the euro fly. Now, I don't have this quote, but I'm told about this quote, that it was Winston Churchill who said that world government cannot come unless you have a unified Europe. Do you see what's at stake? The uh, financial services agreement was a very, very good excuse. Now, let me tell you what we have here in America right now. We have, how many are familiar with the financial, um, the, the banking modernization law, H.R. 10? Anybody know about that? Okay, let me tell you about it. Over in Europe, what they have done in the last couple of years is they have something called financial conglomerates. Financial conglomerates are banks that can sell insurance and stocks and bonds, okay? Now, in America, we cannot do that because we have the Glass-Steagall Act. And the Glass-Steagall Act says that all of your commercial, your investment banking has to be separate from your commercial banking. And so the Glass-Steagall Act says insurance companies cannot own banks and brokerage firms cannot work out of banks. However, what we have seen in the last two years is a series of mergers and acquisitions whereby we now have banks getting into brokerage firms and most recently, one of the most key mergers and acquisitions is the one of Travelers with Citicorp. Why? Travelers represents several kinds of insurance. They bought um, a Solomon Brothers brokerage and now they're, they're, buying, or Citibank, they're buying Citibank, all right? We've just had the Glass-Steagall Act become desecrated. And the HR 10 Financial Modernization Act, Bill, Jim Leach, who is a globalist, a one-worlder, has been pushing that through for a number of years. And they are now at a point that within the next week, that thing should be approved. What will it do? It will put our banks and our insurance companies and our brokerage firms into a different category, financial conglomerates. And that is very serious because when we start taking a look at what is happening in the world, let's take a look at the two major players that we're going to be having. We already have transnational corporations. Now we're going to have transnational banks. They will supersede and transcend all laws. You know, when I went to the World Economic Forum in Davos, they, um, they have this meeting, they've had it once a year for the last 23 years, and it was a very, very incredible meeting because they invite about 1,200 uh, presidents and CEOs of the world's largest multinational and transnational corporations. So yours truly got a chance to talk to some of them. Fascinating. You know why? Because you see, if I were the president of a multinational corporation and I operate up here in the stratosphere somewhere, what would I want? I would want, I, you know, excuse me, I smell something burning just in case anybody wants to know. Okay? Um, 
Uh, you know, God still has plans for me, so I just want you to know that I, I smell something burning up here. Um, <laughs> we're going to get through this, and you're going to get the bottom line because it's important. <laughs> And anyway, I was talking to a couple CEOs, and what I realized was that if I ran a transnational corporation, you know what I would want? An erasure of all the laws so that I could make money. It was incredible. So now they're going to do that for both the banks and the uh, corporations. Just incredible. Now, there's another player we need, public-private partnerships. When I went to the conference in Istanbul, Habitat 2, they um, started talking about partnerships, partnerships. And I sat in a workshop when I first heard the term public-private partnership. And I turned to my friend and I said, what in the heck is a public-private partnership? I started researching it. And then, that was in June of 96, in October of 96, I went to the World Bank that's where I found the book on Charles. And as I was reading what Charles is doing through the Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum, what is he doing? He is setting up public-private partnerships. And I, I started doing more research. I even did some interviews at the World Bank. And they explained it to me. The lady who I talked with was an expert. And she explained it to me, but I couldn't fathom it. It was so simple. Public-private partnership. There are three components of a public-private partnership. First, there's public, which is government. All levels of government, um, your local, uh, state, federal. You can even get foreign governments. Uh, you can even use the, the UN. Okay? So you have the public side, which is government. You then have two kinds of private. First, you have business. You have corporations. Always you'll find a corporation. Then, part of the private are citizen groups, like non-governmental organizations. Let me give you a few good ones. The Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy. You'll always find them in a public-private partnership. And they come together, and then we can have foundations. You can even have the Ford Foundation or the Rockefeller. You know, some of these wonderful foundations that we all know and don't love. <laughs> so how does a public-private partnership look? Well, it's like three circles. And they come together, and in the middle where they meet, that's where you have the partnership. So we have public, which is government. We have private, which is um, corporations and various groups and organizations. Now, what is a partnership? It is a business arrangement. They're out to make money. This is a business arrangement. So what do we really have here? We have a merger between business and government. Can anybody tell me the definition of fascism? That's it, right? Okay. Al Gore reinventing government. How is he doing it? Public-private partnerships. When I was in Davos, Hillary was there, and she gave this speech, a brilliant, brilliant speech, no notes. All of these CEOs, they were so impressed with her, even if they didn't like her. And I tell you, I watched the woman. It was incredible delivery. Not one note, okay? And she talked about the three-legged stool, and she defined it as political, economic, and social. Wasn't that cute of her? She was talking public-private partnership, never mentioned the term. Okay? Now, our government, through the uh, President's Commission on Sustainable Development, has endorsed public-private partnerships. So, how does this work? Well, I've used Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas needs a new sewer system. Now, I want you to know today that you just passed some sort of water thing that you have to have done to your water. And what? Fluoridation. Fluoridation. Okay, I have good news for you. It's not a public-private partnership. You're having your taxes raised. You can thank God for that. Now, they come 
the higher authorities that be, I, look, there are some bright linings in raising taxes. <laughs> when I get done with this, you'll understand. They need $750 million for a new sewer system. They say to the people, we're going to raise your taxes. People say, uh-uh, Jack, you're not raising our taxes. They say, well, we'll have to go back to the drawing board. And they come back and they say, we have some creative financing for you. We have come up with innovative financing. Very rarely will you see the term public-private, but this is what you look for. We are going to come together with some government and some corporations and some local groups, and we're going to come together and we're going to raise the money and manage the sewer system ourselves. What has happened? The sewer, which was under the auspices of local government that was technically owned by the people of the city of Dallas, is now being transferred to a new entity. It's a business arrangement. It's a partnership between the fascist government of the city of Dallas, the state of Texas, anybody else on the governmental level, uh, the Ewing Oil uh, Corporation, the Ewing Foundation, and the Nature Conservancy. Isn't that great? What has happened? Representative government went out the door, and that, that facility will now in the future be run as a business, and you have absolutely no say in what is going on. So let me give you some other examples. Al Gore, public-private partnership to get DC schools online. Doesn't that just warm your heart? Then we have then we have our, our uh, national monument, our own obelisk, uh, the Washington Monument, and they're going to be doing some renovations to it. And I was reading about it. You've got the corporations and the government that are going to help with the renovations, and the Masons are going to do the capstone. And it's... <laughs> Doesn't this make you feel good? And this is going to be a public-private partnership. Okay? Thank you very much. Um, so that's what we now have happening in our own, in our own town. Thank you for your, your, your participation. I appreciate it. I just, I just want you all to stay till the end. That would really make me feel good. What is, what is public-private partnership? A loss of representative government. Now, what I found here with public-private partnership is real simple, and this is in my book. As public-private partnerships go up, the Constitution comes down, right? The more public-private partnerships we have, the less representative government, and they've bypassed and desecrated our Constitution. And we can thank Al Gore for helping us with this. Now, how does, how does Prince Charles fit into this? I told you about the Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum. This is in my book. He works with multinational and transnational corporations from all over the world. The ones in red, like 3M, TRW, Coca-Cola, Smith Klein Beecham, Arco, are all part of the Prince of Wales Business Leaders Forum, along with British Petroleum. Doesn't that warm your heart? British Petroleum and Amoco are going to merge? Gosh, joy, joy. And so with all the foreign country companies and our American companies, and besides those, we have yeah, Abercrombie and Kent, American Express Bank, Arco, Cigna, Levi Strauss, the Perot Group. Sorry for all of you Perot backers. The Perot Group, U.S. West International, American Chamber of Commerce, the City of Charleston, Ford and Kellogg Foundation, the Office of Ronald Reagan. Sorry, Michael. Um, Soros Foundation, Texaco, Tufts, and Turner Broadcasting. All right? What are these companies doing? They are in the inner circle with Prince Charles setting up public-private partnerships. Is the coffee beginning to smell? Okay. Now, it's burning, yeah. Now, we're going to... <laughs> Let's talk about some of the major players. All right? Now... When we start talking about the major players, and 
These diagrams are to be found in my 1997 economic newsletters, okay? Because I wrote about the global economic level last year, about these players and how they interact. We have the trading spheres down here, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank and the IMF, the UN, the Group of Seven, uh, multinational corporations, the repeal of Glass-Steagall and financial conglomerates. We have some other groups called IOSCO and the IAIS, and the Bank for International Settlements. Now, very simply, we're going to go through just a couple of these. Very simply. Now, how many of you are familiar with the Bretton Woods monetary system? You understand the IMF, you understand the World Bank. Good. I'm just going to talk about a couple things with regard to them. As I mentioned, the UN was set up in 1945, the Bretton Woods in 1944, the World Bank. The World Bank was supposed to lend to companies, right, countries, right, that were war-torn. They were supposed to help give them low-interest loans. The World Bank has expanded into many, many different organizations underneath it. And you would be surprised at what the World Bank does in its spare time. They have um, a group called IFC, called the International Finance Corp. And under IFC, did you know the World Bank goes around the world setting up stock, uh, stock markets in third world countries? And that's what they have been doing. They've been setting up stock markets in third world countries. Bermuda, Argentina, China, Ghana, Russia, Panama, Poland, Bulgaria, El Salvador, Hungary, India, Pakistan, Latvia, uh, Armenia, Bolivia, the Czech Republic, to name a few. Why are they setting up stock markets? Because they have talked these countries into selling their state assets. It's called privatization. And they go into, I don't know, Latvia. And they say, you know those diamond mines? Why should the state hold on to those diamond mines? If you privatize, privatize means uh, incorporate it so that they can sell stock and place it on the stock exchange. If you privatize, you can start taxing, and it'll be more efficient. All of our studies show that it's more efficient to privatize than it is for the state, and you'll make money. They don't mention that the World Bank is going to make money setting up the stock exchange. Then they're going to make money uh, advising. And then to help the country out, the World Bank, God bless them, they offer to buy 25% of all the initial shares of that stock. Isn't that great? They're really helping the capitalistic system. The other thing the World Bank does is they are the largest issuer of global bonds. They issue $33 billion a year in global bonds. How do you think they're financing everything for crying out loud? Global bonds. What are they doing with the International Monetary Fund? Well, the International Monetary Fund was to help the countries of the world. It was to create uh, security and stabilization with regard to exchange rates. Well, everything that they want to do now with the IMF is basically make it a world central bank. And that's exactly what is happening where the IMF will have the last word as to what countries can do with regard to their exchange rates and their banking system. Stay tuned. We all know about GATT and the World Trade Organization, and there are some other groups and organizations that we don't have time to go into. How many know the Group of Seven, what the Group of Seven is? Okay. Well, you know, being a, a financial advisor, I'd read the Wall Street Journal and they'd say that they had this Group of Seven meeting but they never really tell you what happened. And about three years ago, I said, I've got to go to one of these meetings. So my first group of seven meeting was in Lyon, France. And I was absolutely dumbfounded to find out exactly what the group of seven is. They operate like a global board of directors. Up here, you have the upper level. You have the presidents and prime ministers of seven countries. The United States, Canada, Germany, Japan, Italy, France, and Great Britain. And they have been meeting for about 21, 22 years. And originally, they met as a result of Nixon taking the world off the gold standard. But little by little, they have expanded their tentacles. So now, what do you hear? Bill Clinton said at the World Bank meeting last week, or earlier this week, whenever it was, what did Bill Clinton say? Terrorism. 
terrorism, terrorism. Well, the other thing they're now talking about at the, I am, uh, at the G7 meeting is the new global economic order. They, they also talk about the environment. There are many, they're not into anything, you can't imagine. In, in the Birmingham meeting this past uh, spring, this is what the group of seven said. They said, there have been times when we have worked together to solve common international problems. Now, we are coming together to solve common domestic problems. Okay? What I, what I realized about the, the, the group of seven is that here we have the board of directors, the presidents and the prime ministers, and each one of them have uh, somebody who assists them called a Sherpa. Now, if you're familiar with the Himalayan trek, that's where they get the idea, the name Sherpa, because the Sherpa puts together the trek and the supplies and the routing and how long they're going to be gone, and they do all the grunt work. Well, every president and prime minister has their own Sherpa. Below them, little by little, they have added the group of seven uh, transportation ministers, the group of seven uh, uh, finance ministers, the group of seven labor ministers, okay, the group of seven environmental ministers across the board. So that when you take a look at our cabinet, you have Carol Browner as a G7 environmental minister, you have Robert Rubin as a finance minister, you have Charlene Barczewski for trade, Madeleine Albright for foreign, for justice Janet Reno, um, for jobs, um, uh, Robert Reich, no, it's, it's um, I had all these, Larry, Larry Slater, it goes on and on. And what is happening? Please listen to the news. They'll say, the G7 transportation ministers met. The G7 labor ministers met. They're meeting all over the world, the G7, in this very capacity. Now, the two, the two that you need to be aware of, basically, is the foreign and the finance. Okay? Robert Rubin is very, very powerful. He is a very key man to watch. And between Madeleine Albright and Robert Rubin, these are the two key areas that, if you will, are getting the most play. Last year in Denver, Madeleine Albright said this, my colleagues and I have focused on how we can work together every day of the year to sustain the security of our people, the security of our people, and the progress of democracy around the world. I asked uh, Madeleine Albright in Birmingham, excuse me, in London, England, where they, uh, where they were with regard to working together. And she laughed and she said, well, if you've read the news, you'll see that we've been very busy this year. Now, when we start taking a look at the group of seven, what we have, basically, this is a new global structure. It is a new global structure. It is the G7. These, this is, they've been melding us together through the group of seven. Now, what happens to the rest of the countries of the United Nations? Let me tell you what the purpose of the G7 is. They are saying to the other countries, the poor, the, down, the downtrodden, and whatever else that's left, after the G7, they're saying, this is the agenda. This is where we're going, and this is where you're going. That's what they're saying. Now, Robert Rubin, let me tell you about Robert Rubin. First, he operates as the U.S. Secretary of Treasury. As U.S. Secretary of Treasury, he is liaison to the Federal Reserve, our central bank. He then is a group of seven finance ministers. He is a governor to the IMF and the World Bank. He's an alternate to Alan Greenspan. And for the Summit of the Americas, he is the lead finance ministers bringing together the other 32 finance ministers to make us one. You see, at the Summit of the Americas, what they are going to be doing to the dollar is all the other countries of, of our hemisphere their dollar is going to be fixed. They're, they're pay, 
excuse me, their peso. Can you imagine the Mexico peso or the Colombian peso is going to be pegged to our dollar? What does that mean? This is the disparity right now. Now, in order to have a, a currency, uh, the Latin American currencies pegged to ours, what has to happen? Ours has to come down and theirs has to go up. Got it? We're going to feel it. So, when we start talking about who rules the world, our question is, how do you control the monetary system of the world? Through central banks. How many of you understand what a central bank is? A number of you. Excuse me. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's mine. I'm, whatever it is. I, uh, I took, a, uh, I took a, a, a tour of the museum for the Bank of England this year. It was very fascinating because, you know, they really tell you exactly what they are. And written on a wall was this definition of a central bank. Quote, the proposal for the Bank of England emerged from a mass of projects beginning in the 1690s. William Patterson, a Scotsman, is generally held to be its originator, a colorful figure. He was a regular promoter of financial products, excuse me, projects. He proposed raising 1.2 million British pounds to be lent to the government at 8%. We're talking 8% in 1690. On the condition that its subscribers were incorporated as a stock company with the title Bank of England. The particular novelty is that there was no time period for the loan and that interest would be paid in perpetuity. In effect, this meant the creation of a permanent national debt. Patterson was backed by a powerful group of merchants. They had that on their wall. Now, can you imagine? I mean, I, was, I, um, I took a photograph of it. No, no, no. No photographs were allowed. So there I was standing there like a fool writing down every word. America got her central bank, as you know, in 1913. So, does the American Treasury have control of our monetary system? No. The central bank, the Federal Reserve does. And so what does Carol Quigley say about central banks? Carol Quigley says this, quote, each central bank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans, to manipulate foreign exchange, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, to influence cooperative politicians, Cooperative politicians. Have you, do you know of any cooperative politicians? <laughs> By subsequent economic rewards in the business world. That's what Carol Quigley said about central banks. Now, every country has a central bank. And so where do they meet? The Bank for International Settlements. Are you familiar at all with the Bank for International Settlements? In Basel, Switzerland, a few of you are. I went to my first um, annual meeting of the Bank for International Settlements. And I'll tell you a little story since we've been so delayed this evening, it won't make any difference, will it? Um, I, I went and I had never been to, first of all, I didn't ask to go. I, I usually fax the Bank for International Settlements and I get a list of documents because I want to know what they're doing. There are a few things I've been tracking. And so in February, I sent them this long list and at the bottom of my facts, I said, when is your annual meeting, and how does a person get credentialed as a journalist? Well, they called me. I'm like, a hello? I said, this is the Bank for International Settlements in Basel? Yes. She said, I have your facts here, and I see that you would like to come to our annual meeting in June. Uh, yes. She said, um, well, she said, we already have our journalist credentialed. However, 
I think I could get one more in. So I said to her, I said, I met your managing director at the World Economic Forum. She said, you? Just like that. You were in Davos? I said, yes, I was. <laughs> she said, I don't think there'll be any problem. I said, wonderful. I got off the phone and I said, God, you are funny. I didn't even, I didn't even ask to go. I mean, they're asking me. So there I am in Davos, and they made this big deal about having lunch. And I had to reply back in writing. I thought, what is this? I'm going to have bank. I'm going to have lunch with the journalist. Not so. I had lunch with the central bank minister. And uh, yeah, wait till I tell you. They assigned me to a table. And so I walked over to my table, and there's this wonderful list the central bank minister of Austria, the central bank minister of Switzerland, the central bank minister of France. Do you know who the central bank minister of France is? Jean-Claude Trichet. Jean-Claude Trichet will be the Alan Greenspan of Europe in four years. My underarm deodorant left. <laughs> so I have a French journalist who speaks English on this side, and I have, a central, I have um, the Austrian central bank minister here. So he's very gracious, and he wants to know where I'm from. I said, Washington, D.C. He looks at me, he says, you flew over here for this? Uh, I said, isn't this the most powerful meeting in the world? And he looked at me like he didn't understand what I was talking about. And I said to him, hey, this is a, this is a true story, so help me God. And so I said to him, um, excuse me. Alan Greenspan has more power than the president. Alan Greenspan has more power than the president. I said, well, of course he does. He said, how so? Excuse me. This is a central bank minister asking me, a lowly journalist. <clears throat> I said, well, I said, are you not a central bank? Yes. I said, do you not manage the monetary system of your country? Yes. I said, that automatically makes Alan Greenspan more important than Clinton. Oh. I'm like, God, you're so funny. So we're eating lunch. In the middle of lunch, he turns to Jean-Claude Trichet. By the way, women were in short supply. There was only one woman per table. OK? <laughs> and so I'm the only woman at this table. And this man turns to Jean-Claude Trichet and says, Jean-Claude, this lady believes that Alan Greenspan has more power than the president. All these men start laughing. So I laugh. And Jean-Claude tells this story, you know, and I won't bore you with the story. And I look at Jean-Claude, <clears throat> we're now all good buddies. I look at Jean-Claude. I said, uh, Mr. Trichet, um, would you mind? I said, I have a question that I'd like to ask you. Now, I asked him this question, which is a very important question. However, he didn't answer that question. This is how he answered my question. He looked at me, and he said, when we come together, we will have 280 million people, you, in America, will only have 265 million people. He said, we are going to be powerful. We are going to make money. Now, I told you my underarm deodorant left. <laughs> the French journalist next to me, smart man, had a pencil and paper, and he's writing underneath the table. OK? I didn't do that. I cannot explain to you what we talked about. But for five minutes, Jean-Claude Trichet and I did an eyeball. And we had an exchange. And do not ask me where this came from. Somehow, our conversation ended right, before I, right after I said, Mr. Trichet, you could step down if you'd like. <laughs> but you see, it fit in to you know, our conversation. I, I said, God, pulse. I mean, all the men stopped talking. And I thought, oh my god. <laughs> Jean-Claude was very gracious, as only a Frenchman could be. 
and told me that central bank ministers take great criticism. And I said, yes, sir, they do. And I, I said, God, may they not remember my name, my face, whatever we talked about. Please, Lord, protect me. I don't know. That's what I do in my spare time. Okay. So I was at the Bank for International Settlement. You all know that Carol Quigley said this. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world central banks, which themselves were private. He said that the system was to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements and conferences. Now, we have... Every country in the world has a central bank. Answer me this. If you don't go along with the program, what do you think the central banks can do to your currency in a matter of seconds? That's right, they can devalue. What do you think happened to Asia? That's right. All right. The Asian currency problem is not because of anything that you read about in the newspapers. They didn't go along with the financial services agreement, and they are now being brought into submission. What is the other thing that the Bank for International Settlements is doing right now? We have about 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, and I will finish up, but it's very important. You see, I have to get the players in so you understand the last 10 minutes of everything I came here to tell you. I didn't come here specifically to tell you the first hour and a half or whatever. I came here to tell you the last 10 minutes. But we all have to be on the same page, okay? The Bank for International Settlements, as a result of the hot money that they have created, as a result of the financial turmoil in Mexico, and what did Mexico do in 1994 or 5? They, remember, they, they, they voluntarily devalued the peso. They voluntarily devalued. What did Malaysia do? They voluntarily devalued. Okay? The Bank for International Settlements along with several other groups, it's in my newsletter, at the behest of the Group of Seven, by the way, this all started as a result of Bill Clinton. We have to give Bill Clinton, listen, Bill Clinton, whatever he's done with Monica Lewinsky, okay, let me, let me tell you something. What he has done in the international realm surpasses anything any other president has done. All right? He set up He's the one who started the ball rolling for what I'm going to tell you about. It's called the Basel Core Principles. And the Bank for International Settlements, which monitors international banks, is now saying we need new rules and regulations for national banks. Okay? And they've come up with the core principles. And these core principles will allow the Bank for International Settlements to start supervising your local bank. And they will come in and they will say, if that bank doesn't do this, it has to be closed. Okay? They are going to be setting all sorts of rules and regulations. They will manage bank management. They will force the bank to send them the report as to what it's doing. It's called the Basel Core Agreement. Now, what is really happening? The Bank for International Settlements, the Federal Reserve is a key member, and Alan Greenspan meets once a month at the Bank for International Settlements, and they plan what they're doing for the whole global uh, realm. They've come up with these core principles to be administered by probably a combination of the IMF and the World Bank. We have HR 10, the Bank Financial um, Modernization Act. You know what it says in the middle of it? We have to adhere to the Basel Core Principles. What did the Financial Times, the Washington Times say in Washington, D.C. about these core principles in H.R. 10? They said, H.R. 10 shifts regulatory powers from the Treasury to the Fed. Okay? What is really happening right now? The last vestiges of economic financial power that we have in our banking system is in the process of being shifted up to the Federal Reserve, the IMF, and the Bank for International Settlements. All right? That's what's in the middle of our Financial Modernization Act. What does this do? 
We take the Bank for International Settlements. It comes down to the countries of the world. The IMF is going to be in charge of it. It looks up to the countries of the world, and it goes down and around, and we have lost not only the banking system of America, but the other countries of the world. We have lost complete economic sovereignty. This is the final thrust. This is the final thrust. So what, what is the G7 saying? What are the world leaders saying? Let me tell you. 1995, Bill Clinton went to the Group of Seven meeting and he said, Mexico taught us that the world clearly needs better tools to identify problems so that this can be prevented. In 98, in January of 98, George Soros said, uh, excuse me, the Washington Post said this about George Soros and, and Rubin. Quote, now in the midst of the Asian financial crisis, this same speculator, George Soros, and the U.S. Treasury Secretary have concluded that the system is broken and needs fixing. In February of 98, Lawrence Summers said at a speech, the Clinton administration has been working to build a global economic system ready for the 21st century, a system in which trade, capital, and know-how can flow through uh, this new system. This new system is not yet fixed. Okay. I interviewed a gentleman in Birmingham. His name is Dr. John, um, Dr. John Curtin. He heads up um, the uh, unofficial secretariat as a group of seven. And uh, he, said, he said, the decision at Birmingham is that transparency is the first step. Transparency means that the bank opens up all of their, their books to everybody else. Okay? I mean, do you, do you think... Clinton is now in the process of being transparent, and he doesn't want to be transparent. That's what transparency means, no secrets. The national supervisors of banks, financial institutions, brokerage houses, insurance companies have to be supervised according to the highest standards. Now, we need a system of supervision, an international system, to see if we are doing it right. All right, so what is going on? We have a new power structure. We have a consolidation of power. We have a mega world cabinet in the process of being formed. We have the group of eight finance ministers that are being merged with the group of eight foreign ministers. We have the World Bank, the IMF, and the World Trade Organization, and they're all coming together as one. There's a major merger right now in the process that is, that is taking place. As a result of the global uh, crises, we no longer have just the G7 finance ministers working on it. All of a sudden, when you hear it's the G7 and the central bank ministers, what has happened? This is what has happened. It's a coup d'etat. The central bank ministers, these private corporations, they are now automatically coming down to our treasury secretary. This is what's happening. Okay. This is a merger, all right? This is a war without guns and bullets, gentlemen and ladies. This is what is going on right now. You have to listen for the words that they're using. And when Bill Clinton said that the G7, the G7, what do you call them, G7, G8, finance ministers would meet with the central bank ministers, that's a new, that's a new pattern, okay? You see, in the last year, this past uh, a group of eight meeting in, Bur in, in London with Robert Rubin and all the other finance ministers, they also asked the IMF and the World Bank and the World Trade to come in. Okay? That's not normal fare. Now the system needs fixing, and they're calling in the central bank ministers. D do you not understand that there was a separation and now they're closing the separation between the private, the private central banks and the treasury departments of the world. That's where we're at. What are some of the proposals to fix the system? Transparency. The IMF already has something set up. Surveillance. They want the IMF now to monitor the flows between countries. What, where the money's coming from, what mutual funds, what brokerage firms or whatever are investing in what country. 
and then they want the country to tell the brokerage firm and tell the IMF, well, we have this debt and we have this debt and we've done this and we've done that, and then the IMF will determine if that can happen. Um, um, in a minute. They want to set up a world bankruptcy court. Countries have nowhere to go if they're bankrupt. Now, when I go to the meeting next week, my, my key question will be with what assets and who takes control of these assets when a country goes bankrupt? What are you taking control of? The biosphere? What are you taking control of? Anything that's not under a biosphere? Okay? What assets are you going to take for this bankruptcy court? Okay? George Soros has recommended an international credit corporation so that when countries realize that they have a problem, they can now go to this other entity, the International Credit Corporation. They want to establish a new international rescue fund. Don't think for one moment that the $18 billion that our, our, our government wants, that the, you know, they want our government to give, that's part of this new rescue fund. Capital control. Um, uh, Alan Greenspan has talked about a lead regulator of some kind, the adoption of the Basel Core principles, the Tobin tax, tax on international currency. Tony Blair said earlier this week that they want a partial, he wants to see a partial merger of the IMF and World Bank. And Clinton has called for a global Federal Reserve. All right? Now that I have your attention, thank you, all right? Senate Bill 1769. Senate Bill 1769. This has already been passed by the Senate, it's in the House. Calls for the establishment of an International Financial Institution Advisory Commission to be comprised of five former U.S. Treasury secretaries. They will determine if the future role and responsibility of the IMF and the merits and costs related to the consolidation of the organization management and activities of the IMF, the IBRD, and the WTO. They are looking to merge now the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. All right? President Clinton has already called for a Bretton Woods conference. And they also want to upgrade that everybody adheres to the Basel Core Principles. This is what I have been tracking for the last three years, not understanding where it was leading. I started with one thing, and then I expanded it to another, and then to another, and then to another. This is what I have told you this evening is basically the economic newsletter that I haven't written yet. That's what you're getting this evening. You're getting it verbally. I have spent two weeks putting this together. There's a whole lot more, but I've spent two weeks putting this together. Let's take a look at, at how this then looks. We have a world without borders, economic globalization, who is up there in the, in, the, in the international? You have the Bank for International Settlements, the Group of Seven, the uh, United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO. We have the trading spheres. I already told you what a public-private partnership is. You see, the free trade areas of the Americas didn't have to go through Congress. Bill Clinton just signed an agreement, a partnership with the other 32 presidents and prime ministers of this hemisphere. Why didn't he have to, why didn't it have to go through Congress? Because it's a public-private partnership. It's a business arrangement for the economic benefit of America. The European, the, the Economic and Monetary Union of Europe, it's a public-private partnership. What they're doing in Africa is a public-private partnership. What they want to do in Asia is a public-private partnership. These are the things that I've been thinking about for the last three years. You can see that they haven't been easy things. I have wrestled. I have done a fair amount of research. 
And the bottom line, after we get through with the Bank for International Settlements, the core principles, HR 10, uh, Senate Bill 1769, all the suggestions, the empowerment and the merger of the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade, is the bottom line is we have the elimination of economic sovereignty. Now, how do I feel in delivering it? I feel absolutely rotten because this is the stuff that has been percolating in my heart and in my soul. I put this together this afternoon. I was trying to formulate what is really the bottom line. This is what, and it's, it's, you know, this is what I do. What is feudalism? Feudalism is when only those people who they say are better than you and I have a right to own land or whatever or have a title. Feudalism comes from where? England. Okay? The feudalistic system. I believe and I state in my book that the bottom line is this, that it is the British royal family behind the United Nations. So bear with me just one more, two more minutes. Through the United Nations system, they're taking our land through biodiversity and man and biosphere, uh, UNESCO, okay? They're taking our water through the American rivers, the American Heritage Rivers Initiative. They're taking our people, politically correct thinking, you either are or aren't. The Earth's resources, you can see economically, the Bank for International Settlements, the financial conglomerates, the multinational, transnational corporations. All right? Who is behind this? Up here, it's the British royal family. We're going back to feudalism through the United Nations. We have Prince Charles working with the multinational corporations, and I assure you, the bank, with public-private partnerships, setting up fascism. This is the bottom line. Now, there was this picture of the Queen giving a, an address to the Commonwealth uh, they met in Edinburgh in 1997 for the first time, I think, like in 15 or 20 years. And I had to cut and paste it to get it all on one page, but this was the picture. And underneath her addressing the Commonwealth, it said, the mother of all nations. What is my conclusion? My conclusion is very simply this. Um, this is taken from my book, 109. I think you can tell I've done my homework. Talking about Prince Charles. Because of who he is, doors automatically open and people flock to him. His tentacles are very strong reaching into every area of life, business, and government. He transcends politics, national borders, and religion. He is very powerful by way of position, lineage, inheritance, importance, and influence. He is out to make society and mold it into his image, which is based on Gaia and corporate global governance through public-private partnerships. This will change life for every person on Earth as we will become slaves to the new 21st century feudal landlords those with the power and money. Sustainable development demands that every crust of bread be measured against what a person produces in order to protect resources for future generations. Is this the new divine right of kings? Do you not realize that we are fighting a second American revolution? This time it is spiritual, no guns or bullets. It is spiritual warfare at its finest. The person the mainstream media would have us believe Charles is, is not the real Charles. The real Charles has a global agenda of his own. He should be recognized as a very major player 
in the end game. So, what now is our response when we start understanding the true agenda? Let's be realistic. Can we do anything about this? No. We have to recognize that we've been in world government for quite some time. It is bigger than you and I. But what are we to do? Why are we here? God put us here for a plan and a purpose. We are the salt of the earth. We, our bottom line is to stand in the gap. We are to stand in the gap. We are to stand in the gap. You know, the, the, the Iwo Jima Memorial, what does that really symbolize? They planted that flag and they said, this is ours. This is our flag. Okay? We have to be involved at every level. It doesn't look like we can do anything. It looks pretty hopeless. But guess what? God wrote the book. We did not. We must hold our elected officials accountable. We must ask them these questions. You see, the bottom line is, we cannot hold them accountable if we don't understand the agenda. That's why you are here. That's why I've done what I have done. But let me tell you the real reason why I have done what I have done. Because you see, a soldier only prepares for battle when he understands that there's a need to prepare. We don't do anything unless we, there's a need, right? I don't get my umbrella out unless it looks like I need it. You are God's foot soldiers. You will be responsible for standing in the gap. And in order to stand, you have got to prepare now. If you think that the life that we have been living is real, you're wrong. This is the good life, okay? I woke up the other day and I said, Lord, thank you. There were no bombs, there were no bullets, nobody knocked on my door. Thank you, Father. That day is coming. I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm not trying to be dramatic. This is what I see after being at 25 conferences, okay? And what I recognize is, if I thought that I have sacrificed, I have not. You see, the ultimate sacrifice is when I say, excuse me, I'm a nationalist, I will not give up my flag, I will not give up my God, okay? that I do is inside. Preparation up here, preparation here, and preparation in the belly. Okay? You see, I cannot stand unless I prepare now. Because if I don't prepare now, my root system, my spiritual root system will not be strong enough. So to you, my brothers and sisters, my fellow Americans, I say something that unfortunately you'll never hear from any lips of the elected or Bill Clinton or even the Republicans in Congress. You see, God has this little principle, and you see, when we are holy before God Almighty, he keeps us in the hollow of, our, of his hand. And if you put a little water in there, Guess what? That water can't fall out because it's in the hollow of my hand. But when I straighten it, it can. Right now, I beg you to get into the Word of God, 
I beg you to ask the Lord, Lord, show me where I am not holy before you. Show me my secret sins, Lord. I did that eight years ago, not knowing that this is where he would lead me, okay? But it's a daily, daily preparation of the heart and the mind and the soul. I leave you with this prayer. I uh, took it from Hezekiah. Um, it's not in the Bible the way that I've written it, but I think you'll get some of the, the feel. Hezekiah's prayer. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of the New World Order, the United Nations, its agencies and related bodies, NATO, OECD, IOSCO, and those who do not fear you and which are sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, these humanistic, greedy, evil, communistic world bodies have laid waste all the nations and their countries. They, Lord, through economic and environmental orchestrations, through mind control, outcome-based education, the worship of Gaia and U.S. laws are looking to create a feudalistic system in which there will be none of the inalienable rights as found in the U.S. Constitution. They want to wipe your name out, O oh God. Now, therefore, our merciful and mighty God, save us from their hands that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, even thou only. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for staying. I just looked at my watch. I know that you all have to get up for work, and I'm going to catch a plane tomorrow. But um, I thank you for your perseverance. Um, I understand that anybody who needs to ask a question has to go to the back. So. And that is Joan's book, Guru of the New World Order, Prince Charles and Sustainable Prince. It's a very inexpensive book and definitely worth the read. It really heightened my awareness. I've already started reading it. Joan, I want to thank you personally for a very powerful and enlightening presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Sure, we got last week's tapes too. Uh, that was brilliant. I, I'm interested in the people who originally conceived this idea of international finance. Can you tell me who the buddies were? of uh, Maury Strong, uh, George Soros, and do you think that Armand Hammer was close to Prince Charles? Was he in, uh, involved with the international financial idea as well? I'll take your last question first. Yes, read my book. Uh, Prince Charles and Al Gore have a common mentor. His name was Armand Hammer. Armand Hammer. Uh, with regard to Maury Strong and his buddy, Maury Strong is a Rockefeller agent. That's the best way that I can name it. He met David Rockefeller when he was 25 years old. They hit it off. They have worked very closely together. And as I mentioned, um, this particular tape, Governing Globalization, has Maurice Strong on it, Coffee Ann, and all of the people. I asked the question. Maurice Strong thought I asked it of him. It's quite funny, um, but it's also quite revealing. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> yeah, Joan, um, say, for example, they. Uh, these men, they can create a global collapse. Now, you know, the, uh, the, the nationalists or the militia or, or the patriots, they want to buy gold. But if they so wish, the, the gold doesn't really matter, does it? No, but it really helps. As long as Joe Average thinks that it's good to barter with, it has value. Perhaps you were in transit today, but uh, what did the Federal Reserve do with this bailout of a heavily 
International Mutual Fund. They called an emergency meeting and got everyone together to bail out a mutual fund that was heavily invested in international. Really? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not up on that one. It was a news burp today. A news burp. Well, I didn't hear any news burp because I was busy finishing what I, I had did. to do for tonight. It was it was a short burp. A short burp. A short burp. I, I, it might be. I would speculate, not knowing that it was the Templeton Fund. Uh, the Temple and Emerging Market Fund? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe it was um, one of their international banker mutual funds. It, w along with what you spoke with tonight, is this a new power for them to be able to do this? Is this something, a new enabling? Uh, yeah, they've got all sorts of new enabling. And really what it is is one buddy crook bailing out another buddy crook. Thank you. Thank you. Joan, thank you so much for tonight, and we know our God loves you, and we love you too for staying in the battle. Um, I want to make people aware that these partnerships can enter your churches. Um, I'm at an excellent church where I live, but there are some new ministries coming in, which I have done some re research on with my friend that's here with me tonight. We're doing a parenting class, which is ungodly. We were going to be, we got the information to our pastor and they stopped it. Uh, there's also martial arts starting up at the church, a class. And this takes Christ off his throne. Be aware of this and it, get on the internet and find information to research some of the things your churches may be getting into. But these are indeed partnerships and it mentions on a leadership network um, an awful lot of information that pertains to this, this type of thing they're doing in the churches. So just beware and then get in and dig and find out what's going on in your church because you, we must get to our pastors. Too many of them aren't on track and they need to get back on track. Give them my book. It's okay. a great way. Give, my, Thank give you. your pastor my book. Um, and let me thank you for that. Let me just make mention with regard to the churches and public-private partnerships that it is, who is the congressman, his name escapes me, handsome black man from Oklahoma? Um, J.C. Watts. J.C. Watts. I was dumbfounded. J.C. Watts is, is heading up a partnership to get churches involved with many of the other kinds of uh, um, groups and organizations and in essence, it will be public-private partnerships in the community with the churches. Yes, sir. You explained that those countries as Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, and Japan, because Thailand. They did, Thailand, because they didn't want to cooperate with the international financial uh, flows, that they were forced to devaluate. With Malaysia, you, you mentioned, could you explain once more how this actually happened? Who was doing this to, to break, bring them to the devaluation? Well, I can't tell you um, specifically because you see, what I have concluded after everything that happened is that when you start taking a look at a banking system in which uh, they can devalue your currency for not going along with the agenda, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to take a look at all of Asia, which was growing at a very high GDP, that one day they're growing and the next day they're, they're broke. I mean, you know. So I can't explain to you, I can say that through my research. But I would highly recommend you get my Asia newsletter. But um, what I don't understand is, how, how would some outside foreign force be able to force, let's say, the uh, finance The central bank. The, the, central the central banks of the oh, world. See. see, every central bank holds currency of, of all the other countries. Uh, the, my question is, how would they do something that's detrimental to their own well-being? How would, oh, how would like the Bank of Thailand How would they be able to, to submit themselves to that Well, you see, if, if, if there's money behind it, if there's money behind it for you, you don't really care about the country. I mean, we have in place roads in every central bank, in every, uh, as president and prime minister around the world. You just grease their palms enough, you can get them to do whatever they want. That's first of all why they're in power to begin with. Um, we can talk a little bit more if that doesn't answer your question. Yes, sir. Thank you for an excellent presentation, Ms. Bion. A couple of quick ones. Do you know about J.R. Bob Dobbs and the Church of the Subgenius? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Close. Do you know anything about J.R. Bob 
Dobbs and the Church of the Subgenius? No. Okay. Also, do you see the act of Ted Turner turning over a billion dollars to the UN as a particularly destructive force to aid their nefarious cause? Um, absolutely, but let's take a look at Ted Turner. Uh, he put it into a foundation. Right. He got taxes, tax write-offs, tax sheltering. Um, my buddy from Cairo, um, uh, the former senator from Colorado, um, Tim Worth. Thank you, Tim Worth, my buddy. We've, we've gone eyeball to eyeball. The man hates me. <laughs> anyway, um, is heading it up. Now, Ted Turner put a billion dollars in. I, I believe most of it was um, uh, TNT stock. And basically, the UN will only get a million dollars a year. But again, we're, we're talking large tax benefits, and he has now challenged the other multinational, transnational companies to do the same thing. Yeah. And then lastly, the destabilization, on the other hand, the destabilization of Bill Clinton personally, is that going to help undermine his causes you so eloquently outlined tonight at all? No, no because, <coughs> excuse me, um, when he gave the speech um, to the UN, all, it was very interesting for the first time in history, all of the G7 countries made a special um, a news presentation that they agreed with what he said. So no, I mean, you know, we've got the mafia there and they're, they're going to, you know, support their own. Being that you're an economist and that you're into forecasting, can you give, can you give us a time? Well, can you give us a time? This is the bazillion dollar question. Give us a timeline on when you think the mark of the beast will come. I mean, the, that you have to have that mark to do whatever right. you have to. Excellent question. I'm glad you asked that. Let me give you my rendition of the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is already in you. All right. It's what you believe, it's what you are, it's your personal relationship to Jesus Christ, it's whether or not you're honest right now in the little things that nobody would ever know. If they give you the wrong change, are you saying thank you if it's to your favor? I mean, you know, uh, the mark of the beast, trust me, God doesn't need to mark us. We've already marked ourselves depending on our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's my, that's my take on the mark of the beast. Will we have it in our hand and all that? I'm, I'm sure it'll come. I'm, I'm sure that um, uh, it will be here. But the bottom line is, uh, you see, it's already in your heart what your mark is. And that's the bottom line. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to ask you, what kind of games is uh, Greenspan playing with the uh, stock market and the economy right now? And what difference does it make whether he raises interest rates or lowers them? I don't see that. Um, he is playing games, thank you. If you'll notice, for the last two years, I thought this was a phenomenon. Every time Greenspan list says something, the world listens and reacts. And a week ago, Greenspan said there will be no interest rate increase, and the markets went down 250 points. Then he's back before the Senate yesterday, which I thought was interesting because he was just there a week ago, and all of a sudden there might be. Let me give you my take on this. We have Asia, or Japan. Let's talk about Japan for a moment. Where has Japan banked? The United States. What have they bought? Our treasury bills. They've bought our treasury bills, our stocks, our bonds, uh, real estate, whatever else. Japan is still in a very serious recession. They want their savings, okay? There was a special sale of U.S. Treasury bills, I think it was $12.5 billion in April, that was sold by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, for, uh, and the seller was unnamed. At that time, Japan would start trying to shore up its currency. Now, when all of this started happening in the market, it was sort of like we had one major catastrophe a week for about a month, okay? I was cleaning house. Occasionally I do do that, but it sounds like I do it all the time. I was cleaning house and I'm vacuuming and I'm like, wait a minute. We have Asia here and they're down. We have Europe and that's got to fly. And we have America holding up Europe and Asia. So what are they doing here if they're messing with the American economy? If they mess around with our consumer confidence, they'll blow the whole scenario. 
And I'm vacuuming, and I said, oh, my God, this is it. Japan wants their money. Real simple. We don't have it to give it to them. So where are they going to get the money to give to Japan? You take it from the stock market. Stock market has gone up. I've got the figures for my next newsletter. It's incredible, the rise in the stock market in the last uh, 10 years. So you sell off a little by little, okay? The scaredy cats will leave immediately. And where are they saying to put your money? Treasury bills, okay? So they're taking the money from the stock market, throwing it in the treasury bills to give it back to Japan. <laughs> oh, I can't prove so... it, but it sure makes sense to me. Oh, that really makes sense. That really becomes transparent now that you mention it. Okay, now, wait, wait, one more thing. Interest rates. Right now, we have, in comparison to inflation, the highest interest rates ever, all right? I mean, well, they're not at 15, they're at five and a half, but the bottom line is inflation's only at one, okay? So we have very high interest rates. We have a loss, there's no credit in the system. There's no credit in the system. That's why we have high interest rates, okay, in comparison to inflation. Now. In order to keep Japanese money, what do they have to do? They've got to raise interest rates. Okay? They really can't afford to lower interest rates, in my opinion. If they lower interest rates, it's going to be a quarter of a percent or something that means nothing. And it's going to be just a token, just to try and hold for as long as they can until they need to do what they need to do. So you think, you think ultimately in the future they'll end up raising interest rates to hold the money? In my opinion, no doubt. That's my opinion. I uh, also wanted to ask you, it seems like uh, Clinton's womanizing is a great smokescreen to cover all the dirty tricks that's going on underneath all that. Always. Absolutely bottom line. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. How will the Y2K computer crisis affect uh, either help or hurt the Phase 4? Oh, you're a smart lady. Um, you know, you have to formulate that question to make me ask it. Answer it. Um, I, I want to write, as soon as I get done with the newsletter that I'm three months behind in writing, um, but I've only been out of the country five times this year, um, I'm writing and I'm doing the research now for a major um, article on Y2K because in my research, Y2K basically will fulfill every single one of the UN agenda items. Instead of waiting 10, 15 years, they can do it in two. One big bang. How will it affect phase four? They have the money in the bank. They control the assets, bottom line. You don't do what they want you to do, whether it's Y2K or something else. The basal core principles give them the authority. And our Congress has given them the, has let the power go to the international level. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask you about Y2K too. I'll just say keep vacuuming. Thank you. <laughs> Two smart ladies. How, how many conferences have you attended? I've gone to 24 conferences, 12 of them have been outside of the country, 5 were this year, and next week will be my 25th conference at the IMF World Bank meeting. How many of those? Washington, D.C. All I have to do is pay for parking. How many of those conferences did you see David Rockefeller at? Um, I haven't seen David Rockefeller at any of the conferences. The Ford Foundation has been at numerous conferences. Well, I know that he attends many of the important conferences because he's directly involved in this uh, money scandal that's going on. Well, you know, um, David Rockefeller has a lot of emissaries, and so believe me, um, he doesn't have to go himself except maybe for the Bilderberger meeting or something else. I have not been to a Bilderberger meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So you'd recommend buying the Mexican peso right now, huh? <laughs> um, if you want some fun in your life, yes. Um, I but actually, if you want to do, you want to do something a little bit more safer, I'd buy dehydrated food. Yeah, yeah, that too. 
But uh, I, would, I just wanted to mention to the people that uh, right up in uh, Northern California, up in Yosemite, they're privatizing the uh, ranger service where they don't have forest rangers up there anymore. They have just a private company that's up there managing the um, campsites and uh, the facilities up there. They're doing that all over. It is very scary. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are night owls out here, aren't you? <laughs> uh, I am concerned that all our banks are beginning to be merging here and what the real reason was for that. Financial conglomerates and the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act and the passing of H.R. 10, the financial modernization law. And that puts our banks in more danger now? Too. Absolutely. Not only that, but you see the mega banks will, will wipe out the small individual banks. So, you know, what we really have is the titans of the titans, uh -huh. both in the banking system and in the transnational corporations, and the elimination of the individual businessman like you and me. Well, then we should not leave our money in the banks because convert that to something to protect ourselves. Well, that, that's a whole story that you'll have to invite me back to speak on in the next two months. Wow. All right, let me give you my demand. We start on time, we have a backup overhead, and you invite all your friends. This We're is not a criticism of the Granada Forum. <laughs> Ms. Beyond? Yes? Where do the Rothschilds fit into all this? I apologize, what? Where do the Rothschilds fit in all this? What level? They're way up. Um, we're talking the central bank level, along with the Rockefellers. Uh, we're talking liaison with the British royal family. Uh, we're talking very high, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, I want to remind you, four years ago I knew none of this. Two. If my mom could be here. Two quickies. One, what's your attitude or posture towards junk silver at this, at this level in the marketplace for people to hold mercury dimes, et cetera, on the basis of what's going to be happening with our currency that people will be able to survive? Um, it depends on when they bought their junk dimes, but the bottom line is I don't care what happens in the future if all hell breaks loose. Um, junk dimes will be worth a whole lot more than no matter when you bought them. Right. Number two, I don't know if you caught it yesterday, they're making a proposal that everyone who flies on a plane will have to register their next of kin. What? Will, oh, will go in, yeah. It'll go into a computer bank. Nothing, just another freedom we're losing. I just thought you'd be interested in knowing that they're doing it. It's already being proposed as of yesterday. Well, I'm really happy about all of this. Thank you. <laughs> Joan, I don't know if it was... After where I've been, my goodness. I don't know if it was in any of the L.A. papers, but our little Antelope Valley Press had an article yesterday that American Airlines, Qantas, British Airways, and a few others are merging, and they're going to call it One World Airlines. Doesn't that warm the cockles of your heart? And then does anybody know if the fast track trade bill passed the House today? No. It didn't pass? It did? No, I don't know. Did it pass? I don't know. I didn't oh. hear. You see, when I was down in, in the summit of the Americas, uh, the only thing I read about when I came back from Santiago was that Bill Clinton didn't have fast track. Never mind that he, pa that he signed the free trade areas of the Americas. That was never, ever, ever reported. But that what he needed was fast track. All that does is give him greater dictatorial powers. Yes, it was supposed. To, it was scheduled by Newt Gingrich to be voted on the House today. Oh but my! What a the, great uh, globalist, Newt Gingrich. Yes, but maybe uh, it got pushed aside. But we need to call our Congress if it hasn't passed. Thank you. Um, Bill, when I was um, when I was on Michael Reagan's show today, Michael Michael's um, question of the day is this. Something about Dan Quayle, Dan ha Quayle has suggested that there be a, a, um, an agreement that Bill Clinton uh, resign and then Al Gore pardon him. And so Michael wanted to know what everybody thought, and of course Michael thought it was okay. And so <laughs> I made sure I got in uh, my two cents in, in, in an answer, and I told Michael, I said, with regard to your question, Michael, let's nail him to the wall. 
Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering when those tapes came out on uh, Clinton recently, the tapes, you know, he was at the United Nations. I didn't hear anything about, what was that with terrorists or something? Do you know anything? No, he was, uh, he was at the United Nations. He gave a, a major speech at the United Nations on Monday. And uh, in his speech, he talked about global terrorism and how he was working on the uh, elimination of global terrorism. And let me just mention for everybody that I have a report on the International Criminal Court. And in that report, I talk about the fact that what the Group of Seven has been working on for the last three years is merging and integrating from the highest levels, like the CIA, KGB level, on down to the local police force, um, different ag agreements to merge uh, all of the police, uh, police and law enforcement from the global to the local so that they can work on combating international terrorism. Yeah, they have that new phone number in Los Angeles. It has to do with localizing the fire department and the hospitals and I don't know if that has to do with anything. Well, that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the steps that I have seen, not that I've read about it in their material. Yes, sir. Yes, I was wondering if you know if the Masons have any part of global uh, elite? Are they part of the global elite? Absolutely. And where they fall in place? They, <laughs> they're up there with the British royal family. Uh, because the British royal family is Masonic. Chivalry is Masonic. This is all Masonic uh, of the highest level. And I would highly recommend that you get Dr. Stan's speech from the Granada Forum from a couple uh, months ago. I don't know what it's called, but I have his tape called The Brotherhood of Darkness. And I was also noticing that the universal flag of the, of the Masons, Freemasonry, that the UN has that same exact flag. Oh, really? I wasn't aware of that. With the, everything is exactly the same, and even is in color. The universal surprise, flag. surprise. All right. You have been an excellent audience. One more? One more, yes, sir. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a brief comment regarding the, the British royal family being behind a lot of this. Yes? A few months ago, we had a speaker named Dave Hinkson, who was an expert on common law. Uh -huh. His conclusion was the same. Uh, the Queen of England owns most of the physical land in this country through common law. And I don't understand all the details, but it has to do with the surveys and the high watermark and admiralty law. But he came to the same conclusion. Excellent point. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless you.